2021 has been another extraordinary year in the unfolding purpose of our God. What has dominated this year, as far as society generally is concerned, is the problem of climate change, as they call it. And of course, in Glasgow, they, they held what is called COP26. And it had, unfortunately for them, some dubious outcomes. Nations were committing to things that they probably will not keep because, of course, it all comes back in the end to money and money drives the economies of the world. And so this matter of climate change has been on the minds of many people. They know, they know that the, the day is coming when mankind's corruption of the, the very environment in which he lives will lead to tragic consequences. And then, of course, the global COVID-19 pandemic continued to disrupt normal life around the world. But in the Kremlin, this very smart gentleman called Vladimir Putin continued to step up his manipulation of world politics. And we'll be considering a little bit of that tonight. He squeezed Ukraine and threatened ultimate integration with Russia, as we will again consider from his own writings tonight. At the mean, in the meantime, more past enemies of Israel made peace or endeavoured to seek peace with Israel, which of course is an incredibly astonishing thing given the history of the last 50 or 60 years. Several massive Chinese real estate companies, one in particular, are on the verge of collapse and just yesterday the major company that is in trouble was unable to make payments. They, were, they said they could, but they didn't. There's something going to happen there pretty soon. And soaring house prices, not only here in Australia, but around the world. Growing inflation, particularly in America, and the threat of rising interest rates all around the world are, of course, something now that is coming into view. It was rising interest rates that brought the world to the Great Depression of 1930 onwards. In 1929, the US Treasury put up interest rates that brought the stock market down, and of course the rest is history. Lebanon continued to descend into utter chaos. Hezbollah blocked every attempt to inquire into that awful explosion on the 4th of August 2020 that killed over 200 people and maimed thousands more, destroying a good proportion of the central part of the city of Beirut, and led ultimately to the collapse of the government as the people cried out for change. The latest thing to happen in that, brothers and sisters, is that Russia has now entered the scene. Putin takes advantage of every problem situation around the world. He's got his fingers in every single pie. And of course, it always had to be that way, according to Ezekiel 38. Israel continued to build settlements, even with a new governor, in the West Bank, with a view, of course, ultimately to annexation of the West Bank, as is required by Ezekiel 38. And verse 8, because when God comes down upon the land, it doesn't come down through the central mountains of Israel in a state called Palestine. He comes down upon what's called the mountains of Israel. And so Israel will have control. It will be part of Israel proper by the time of Armageddon. Britain launched a worldwide trade blitz as trade and political tensions with the European Union increased. And Queen Elizabeth nears 70 years on the throne, which we believe will fulfil Isaiah 23. And towards the end of our talk tonight, we're going to have a look at Isaiah 23. What a remarkable woman she has been, given what's happening in her own family. So why no reference in that list that I've just read out to you to China? Well, Brother Ken Whitehead has a six-part series on China, to complement his earlier writing that was included in our mid-year review that most of you will have received and probably read. He's actually now got a six-part series on YouTube and I'm going to get our brother a recorder uh, to pass that around to the Ecclesia. So I'm not going to do too much on China tonight, just make a reference here and there. But of course the world's attention right now is on China, which is becoming very aggressive in many different aspects, both on the oceans and in the political arena. But it's back to Ezekiel 38 that we must come. 
And here, of course, are the literal translations of Ezekiel 38, verse 2. Rotherham's translation, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Mago. So Gog, a dictator, the name has the idea of one at the top, is from the land of Mago. So we need to identify that land and we need to see what's happening now as a fulfilment, a near fulfilment of that requirement of Ezekiel 38 verse 2. His Prince of Rosh, which we know is the, is the ancient form of the name Russia, Meshech, the Muscovites, that is the city of Moscow and its area, and Tubal, the area of Siberia. And the Amplified Bible has almost precisely the same translation as Rotherham. So we know that that's as close as you're going to get in the English to the Hebrew of Ezekiel 38. So Mago, when you look up maps and historians, and this is as good as we can get, where you see that red circle, the line that goes around, and it embraces, of course, the country of Ukraine. To the north of that is the country of Belarus. Over to the western side, you've got Germany. Now, you would normally say, well, Mago is Germany. Well, that's not precisely true. It includes Germany, but it also includes a much larger territory that is now today in Russia and in the two countries to the southwest of Russia, that is Belarus and the Ukraine. And I want to demonstrate to you what I believe is happening as a fulfilment of Ezekiel 38 verse 2. There has been, of course, for some years now, a very tense situation between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine is trying to enter the European Union. It wants to become part of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, which of course is primarily funded and controlled by America. And just of late, in fact yesterday, Putin and Biden, the President of the US, held an internet Zoom type summit. And it was very, very clear that they're on different pages. Russia is very concerned about Ukraine becoming part of NATO. They see that as an encroachment on their territory. And that's Putin's red line. Ukraine will not become part of, the, of NATO or the European Union, he says. Biden, on the other hand, says, well, we want Ukraine to be part of NATO. So you can see that this is building up to something. In Ezekiel 38 and verse 2, we read those words, Gog of, <coughs> of the land of Mago. What does that mean? Well, that means that this is his central place of origin. This is where he comes from. This, this is the essential place of Go. It just happens to be, of course, Ukraine and Belarus. I want to just delve into that. Vladimir Putin has recently written a very extensive piece. His title was on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. Pretty recent, 12th of July, 2021. And he says many, many things, but I've just selected a few little things that he says. During the recent direct line, which of course was one of these conferences online, when I was asked about Russian-Ukrainian relations, I said that Russians and Ukrainians were one people, a single whole. These words were not driven by some short-term considerations or prompted by the current political context. It is what I have said on numerous occasions and what I firmly believe. If Putin firmly believes something, watch out. He goes on to say, I therefore feel it necessary to explain my position in detail and share my assessments of today's situation. Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians are all descendants of ancient Rus. And in that, he is factually correct. Because, you see, the area of Ukraine was the original home of the Rus. And a bit further to the north, in Belarus. So it gets named Belarus. And Kiev was the first capital of the kingdom of the Rus, going right back into the 900s AD. He goes on to say, which was the largest state in Europe at the time. Slavic and other tribes crossed the vast territory from the, the, from the Doga, Novgorod, uh, Sv Sv to, to Kiev and to Chernigov. We're bound together by one language, which we now refer to as Old Russian. Economic ties, the rule of the princes of the Rurik dynasty, 
And after the baptism of Rus, the Orthodox faith, which of course is now deeply installed in Russia today. The spiritual choice made by Saint Vladimir, who just happens to be Putin's great hero, Vladimir I, it says he ruled from Kiev, who was both Prince of Novgorod and Grand Prince of Kiev, still largely determines our affinity today. The throne of Kiev held a dominant position in ancient Rus. This had been the custom since the late 9th century. The tale of bygone years captured for posterity the words of Oleg the prophet about Kiev. Let it be the mother of all Russian cities. Now start thinking about that. You can see what the scripture is saying. Gog is of the land of Magog. It's the motherland. It's the homeland. It's the, it's the original kingdom of the Rus. That's why Putin wants it. And that's why he's going to get it in due time. I am confident, he says, that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. I would be shivering in my shoes if I was the president of the Ukraine. Our spiritual, human and civilised ties form for centuries and have had their origins in the same sources. They have been hardened by common trials, achievements and victories. Our kinship has been transmitted from generation to generation. It is in the hearts and the memory of people living in modern Russia and Ukraine, in the blood ties that unite millions of our families. Together we have always been and will be many times stronger and more successful, for we are one people. Watch out, Ukraine. You see, right now, Russia has got 90,000 troops on the eastern border of the Ukraine. That's why they had this meeting yesterday. They want to try and head off a conflict, an invasion by Russia of the Ukraine. All that is required is some set of circumstances that takes the attention of the world away from that situation and history shows that Putin will move. He will send in the troops, just like he did in February 2014 to take over the Crimea, which of course was essentially part of the Ukraine. This article, <clears throat> Vladimir Putin is testing the weak West in Ukraine and Poland was written in November, 23rd of November this year. And it said this, Putin's hunger for geopolitical respect and his desire to avenge perceived historical injustices helped to explain his apparent obsession with Ukraine. And he does have an obsession with Ukraine. Fueled by chauvinist stereotypes inherited from the Soviet and Tsarist eras, Putin continues to insist that modern Ukraine's natural place is with Russia and rejects overwhelming evidence demonstrating the Ukrainian population's preference for Euro-Atlantic integration. You see, they want one thing, the Bible wants another. And now we see the way that this is turning out and we know that the scripture will come to pass. But as I noted before, the land of Magog of old also includes Belarus. And you will note that this year, Belarus exploded. When you go back and you see what happened as a result of the disputed election in 2020, when Alexander Lukashenko, the oldest uh, dictator in, in the world at the moment, basically, certainly in Europe, how he, he managed that election and fraudulently regained power when it was obvious that he had lost it. So of course the nation erupted and many thousands of people were either killed or were imprisoned. The, the other you know, partner to that election who probably is the rightful heir to the, of the uh, government of, of uh, Belarus had to flee. She's in another country because if she returned to the country she would be dead. So to hold on to power, as the streets were filled with, with all sorts of protests that went on for months on end, Lukashenko had to go and get support from Vladimir Putin. Can you imagine walking into his office and saying, Vladimir, can you help me out without having to pay some kind of huge price for the benefit? Well, of course not. And that's exactly what Putin would have got from that meeting. He would have got some kind of agreement that when Lukashenko either falls from power through the rising up of the people 
or through some other means, Russia's just going to step back in again. Belarus used to be part of the USSR, and so it's part of NATO. Isn't that interesting, the way that these things are unfolding? So this crisis that resulted from Belarus inviting the Middle East refugees, which has just been in the news recently, where Lukashenko, to try and take attention away from the other problems, invited all of these people in the Middle East who had fled from Iraq or Iran or somewhere else or Syria. And he gets them into Belarus with a view to them crossing over into the European Union to find refugee status. He won't let them over, neither will the Poles on the other side. And of course this was, this was some thing that was invented by Lukashenko uh, in order to, to gain some kind of stability in his, uh, in his nation. So when the dictator is forced to abdicate, there's no doubt that Putin will take over Belarus and return it to the old Soviet Russian fold. And we'll have a fulfilment, brothers and sisters. When those two things happen, when Ukraine and Belarus fall, we'll have a fulfilment of Ezekiel 38 verse 2. Go. Whoever that might be. I personally think it probably will be Putin, but it may not be. It doesn't really matter. Go will be of the land of Magog. They will have in possession the original kingdom territory of the Rus. That's why the next word is Prince of Rosh or Rus. Now, moving on in Ezekiel 38, I just want to highlight a couple of things about verses 5 to 7. Persia, which of course is that large area, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the large area from Syria across to Afghanistan, Ethiopia, which is Sudan, and Libya, <coughs> which is the, the Libya of today. These are part of the confederacy of Gog at the time of Armageddon. There's also Goma. And I want to talk about Goma tonight because things have been happening there in the last few months. The Galatians or Gauls who migrated west to France, Holland and Belgium are the Goma of Ezekiel 38 and verse 6. So what we've got here is a prophecy that concerns those who will be part of the Russian confederacy. We've also got things happening now again. As we did have last year, there was a war between <coughs> Azerbaijan and Armenia over, over a, a, a disputed territory. That is, is firing up again between those two nations and Putin is pulling the strings in both nations. One day he will have control of that region of Armenia and Kurdistan, the Tagama of Ezekiel 38 and verse 6. Goes on to say about this power, go, be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them, as the Hebrew word means, a guard of a prison. And Jacinia says, a custodian. So here is a nation, this power of Russia, that is manipulating the nations around it, and little by little, one by one, is bringing them under its control. That, of course, is telling us how close we are to the end. Back in 2014, a Spectator article had this illustration of Putin, and it said in its heading, Vladimir Putin's new plan for world domination. After so Sochi, which of course was the Winter Olympics there, and Crim Crimea, that's the events of February and March 2014 when Russia came and took it over, the world. So they knew back then that those things would lead to Putin playing all around the world. And this latest article, this one is February the 20th, 2019, from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, made a few very important points. Its heading was, Russia's global ambitions in perspective. The return of global Russia. And they, they comment, over the past several years, the international community has witnessed the return of Russia as an important global actor. Is this a fundamentally new phenomenon? Or is it the result of the Kremlin's opportunism under President Vladimir Putin and the transformation of his foreign policy? Well, it's pretty obvious what it is. And part of that article says this, it's a pretty lengthy article. Success begets more success. And since Putin's return to the presidency in 2012, his record has been enhanced by what Russian officialdom sees as several important wins. 
the annexation of Crimea, the war in eastern Ukraine, the military deployment in Syria, the tense military standoff with the West in the Baltic and Black Seas, and the interference in US and European domestic politics have all enhanced Russia's image as a major power with significant power projection capa <coughs> capabilities as well as Putin's reputation as a bold and skilled leader. These victories have also demonstrated to the world Russia's propensity for risk-taking and punching above its weight, along with its improved capabilities for warfare and operations short of war in multiple domains, <coughs> land, air, space, sea, cyber and information operations. But here I found something very interesting. You see, when Russia took over the Crimea in 2014, the European Union, the US and others put sanctions on Russia. Now those sanctions hurt. Trade was, was dented, uh, Russian goods were not accepted elsewhere, etc. Didn't bother Vladimir Putin. And this article points that out under the heading, Not Constrained by Economy. Moreover, the, the Kremlin's record since 2012 suggests that it will not be deterred or constrained by economic difficulties. The Russian economy has performed poorly since then, with growth hampered by a failure to institute long overdue structural reforms and excessive dependence on exporting hydrocarbons and other raw materials. But economic difficulties have not put a brake on Russian activism abroad. To the contrary, the Kremlin's ability to withstand both domestic economic difficulties and Western sanctions without changing course is a sign of Moscow's commitment to an activist foreign policy as a long-term choice of the country's leadership. That's very important. It's significant. Russia has, as I said, 90,000 troops on the Ukrainian border right now. Putin and Biden held their Zoom summit on the 7th of December over the growing crisis. And as I said, Putin's red line is that the Ukraine must not become a member of NATO, but the US is determined that it will, and threatens huge economic sanctions, not war, economic sanctions if Russia invades. That won't worry Putin at all. And when the right time comes, he will move. And he will also move, we believe, in Afghanistan. You know, this year, 2021, saw the stunningly rapid takeover of the whole of Afghanistan by the Taliban. It shocked the world. It was a humiliating defeat for Western powers, particularly the United States, which suffered significant losses of lives and equipment in a hasty forced withdrawal. A couple of years ago, though, Putin said if the Taliban, Taliban controlled more than the 40% of the country that they then controlled, Russia would invade again, as they did in 1979. You know, the day will come when something's going to occur there. And of course, Afghanistan is in deep trouble. Because of the sanctions of the US and other nations, the failure to recognise the Taliban as a legitimate government, Afghanistan is descending into political and economic chaos. There are people starving there. There are people fleeing from that country as best they can to into, into Iran, which is not a great place to go, and into Pakistan particularly. It's an awful situation that is developing. Something's got to give there. So what I want to do is spend a little bit of time, again, on this matter. And to do this, we go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, which we've considered in these sessions before. It's a very important passage. We know that Daniel 7, in the first eight verses, deals with the four great world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. When you get to verse 7 of Daniel 7, you've got the fourth empire, which we know as Rome. After this, he says, I saw in the night, <coughs> in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, he says, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, iron of course, the identifying metal of Rome. It devoured and broke in pieces, 
and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. That area in green is the, is the one we want to focus on again. If you read Christadelphian writings, there is a suggestion, going right back to Brother Thomas, that the residue here is in actual, in actual fact all other nations. I don't believe that is the, is the case. I believe Bar Brother Maurice Stewart is correct on this. And this is what he wrote in the American version of his study notes on the prophecy of Daniel. You won't find this in the Australian version, but you'll find it in the American version. He said this about Daniel 7 and verse 7 and the stamping of the residue. Let us emphasise here as an important statement that has not as yet been fulfilled. Rome has never trampled the residue of Persia underfoot. It has never occupied all this territory. A power must yet arise which will occupy the territories of Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome to be afterwards subjected to a higher power, namely Jesus Christ. And then he says this, Russia will do this. Thus, like the image of Daniel chapter 2, whose metals will have to be confederated together before they can be broken to pieces together, so also this terrible fourth beast division, vision has a latter day application. And when you look at Daniel 7, what happens is that these kingdoms are successive. So the Medo-Persians devoured up the territory of the Babylonians, that territory. Then along comes Alexander the Great, and he devours the entire territory of the Medo-Persians. Then along comes, of course, that's the Grecian Empire. Along comes, in 67 BC, the Roman Empire. But it doesn't devour all of the territories of the previous empires. There is a residue. And that residue has to be stamped with the feet of it. And so you've got to have a revived fourth beast. In fact, you've got to have revived all the beasts because those nations that inhabited these regions that were controlled by the empires are all drawn together into one massive image empire. Well, who would do that? Well, of course, Russia will bring on board its European confederates there will be a reformation of the old Roman Empire territory and Russia will have control of it politically and they will take control of the area that's called the residue. Now, in 118 AD, Hadrian, who, who had conquered quite a bit of territory to the east, died. And his successor Trajan decided that he would draw a line north-south you can see the red line on that map. It went down through Syria and Jordan of today. And so that became the eastern border of the Roman Empire until, of course, its dissolution under the hands of the barbarian nations. So what's the residue of the three empires that Rome never took? It's that area you can see bounded by that red line. It includes portion of Syria. It includes Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and half of Pakistan up to the Indus River. That territory just happens to be the territory that's called in Daniel chapter 11 the King of the North. It's the old Seleucid Kingdom, the King of the North. And without going into the details of Daniel chapter 11 verse 40, which we've done before in this place, what it means is this. Russia cannot be scripturally called the king of the north until it has that territory of the old Seleucid kingdom. And of course they are very, very active in Syria, particularly in Iran. They're, getting, they're going to become active shortly in Afghanistan and they're also active, by the way, in Pakistan. It won't be long. And the day will come when they will take political control of that region right across to the Indus River they will have stamped the residue with the feet thereof, which is about military operations. And when they've got that territory, then they become the biblical king of the north. Then they can take Constantinople, or Istanbul as it's called today, become the headquarters of the eastern leg of the image empire of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And then, from there, they can plunge down into the Middle East, 
into Israel and Egypt. And of course, we know what happens then. So some very interesting things are happening in relation to Ezekiel 38. I want to just consider briefly some of the th amazing things that have happened as what we might call end time players are being shuffled around in a way that they would never have anticipated. You weren't a Bible student, you could never have foreseen these things happening. But we know that they were going to happen. Britain and France are at odds over fishing licences, refugees and Brexit rules. A bit more about that in a minute. Relations between Australia and China, leave alone other nations, have hardened in the last year or so, forcing Australia to pursue other trading partners, like Britain, for example, with whom we now have a free trade agreement. Australia's cancellation of its submarine contract with France this year, under the AUKUS alliance, shattered relations with France. Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, some North African states like Morocco and Egypt are all seeking diplomatic relations with Israel. That was unheard of just 10 years ago or less. Sudan, which by the way under its civilian government was also cuddling up to Israel, is now causing crisis. The military coup has stifled the growing friendship with Israel. Why would that be the case, do you think? Well, because you see, Sudan is the Ethiopia of Ezekiel 38 and verse 5. They are part of the Russian confederacy that comes down upon the mountains of Israel. They can't be friendly with Israel. They've got to be on the other side. That's why these things are happening. You know, as I surveyed what's happened in this last 12 months, brothers and sisters, I marvel at the activity of the angels. I mean, I, I get exhausted just thinking about the things that they have their fingers in, every pie on earth. And all of these things are not happening by accident. They're happening because the angels are manipulating these events to bring them to pass. And why would that be the case? Because God wants you and me to know that he's about to send his son back to the earth. We have been given a, an absolute package of fulfilling Bible prophecy in the last five or six years that I didn't see in 45 years in the truth. But it's happened in the last five or six years. Why? Because God wants us to be ready for the return of his son. Let's now take up the matter of France in the Bible. Here's Ezekiel 38 verse 6 that I referred to. Goma one of the confederates of Gob, and all his bands, in other words, not just Goma, but those around him, the house of Tagama of the North Quarters, which we point out is not a reference to Turkey, it's a reference to Armenia and eastern uh, Turkey, the area of Kurdistan, and all his bands and many people with them. This is what Brother Thomas wrote in Elpis Israel way back in 1848, published in 1849. In this general description, and he's talking about this passage in Ezekiel 38 verse 6, may easily be discerned that extended portion of the west of Europe, comprehending ancient Gaul, Belgium, and the countries bordering upon them, which constituted in our day the Napoleon Empire. Goma then points immediately to France. It is a curious coincidence that Louis Philippe paid his visit to England in the Goma. When this vessel was thus named, did they adopt it elusively to their country being originally peopled by the descendants of Goma? Isn't that interesting? The very boat that he used to go to England was called the Goma, the, the name, the biblical name for the country of France. So here is France and those nations around like your Belgians and your Luxembourgs and so on. They're included in this prophecy. They're part of the Govian Confederacy. And of course, in recent times, we've seen some remarkable things happening in relation to France. 2016, of course, is a result of the Brexit vote. France and Britain have been at loggerheads over aspects of, the, of Brexit, including fishing rights, training rules, refugees wanting to enter Britain, a handful of them died, 30 of them, of them died recently trying to cross the English Channel from France to Britain. 
So they've come from the, the, the shores of France where they don't want to stay, apparently. They want to be in Britain. Well, these problems are now at a fever pitch. And the relationships between Britain and France, whatever nice words they might say in their diplomatic exchanges, they are, in fact, deeply divided. As the scripture required it to be. And the AUKUS alliance hasn't helped it. AUKUS, by the way, is an acronym. A stands for Australia. UK stands for the United Kingdom. US stands for the United States. So here you've got Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, who now have this political alliance. It's more than a political alliance, it's a military alliance, in a sense. That alliance, which of course was announced just a few months ago, resulted in the cancellation of an $80 billion submarine contract between, between France and, and Australia, wrecking the diplomatic relationship between those two countries. And of course the Prime Minister has copped a lot of flack over that because the, the President of France accused him of lying. Well, prophecy requires France to be an ally of Russia at the time of Armageddon, while Britain and her allies will oppose them. So don't think that these things that are happening almost every day are just sort of, well, that's happened. It's happening because the angels are at work to bring to pass Bible prophecy. These nations would not have chosen these positions necessarily, but they have been forced into them because God is at work. And we know how important that 13th verse of Ezekiel 38 is. Sheba and Dedan, which we are not going to go into the, tonight, the countries on the, on the, on the southern border <coughs> of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and in the Gulf, who have made peace or are making peace with Israel. But we are going to talk a bit about Tarshish. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? So here's your opposition to the Gogian invasion. And we know that Tarshish can be identified in scripture and by history with Britain. And the young lions, of course, are obviously those who, have, who owe their existence to British colonisation. And you've got Australia and Canada and India and New Zealand, who were, of course, the young lions supporting the old lion in the First World War. So these things we have seen. Uh, coming to pass. The, the, the movements with Sheba and Divan, and of course, now we've got the movements in relation to the merchants of Tarshish. And we don't emphasise that term merchants enough. The merchants of Tarshish. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me this. That while Britain was part of the European Union, their trade was governed by the European Union. They were dependent on the rules that applied to all nations of the 28 in the European Union. They didn't have the liberties to trade with whom they wanted to trade. It's all changed since, of course, Brexit became a reality a year or so ago. Now, why is this remarkable? Why is it important? Well, this is an article, November the 22nd, 2021, so it's a week or two old. It's a title. Here we go. Brexit Britain readies for five-star year of trade. Could never have happened while Britain was part of the European Union. But it is happening. European Union watches on with envy. So Britain continues to unravel its ties with Europe, both political and economic, is now going to go somewhere else. And it's doing just that. And the article goes on to say this. In 2022, the UK will launch trade talks with India, Mexico, Canada and the Gulf Cooperation Council, while also on track to secure accession to the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now that particular partnership also includes uh, countries uh, throughout the, the uh, Pacific Ocean, including the United States. So here we've got this, this now campaign by the British to trade with the rest of the world, which they could not do freely under the rules that govern them in the European Union. And sitting on the throne of Britain is Queen Elizabeth II, 
who on the 6th of February 2022 will have ruled Britain for 70 years. Anybody know any other king who ruled for 70 years? No, not even in the Bible. Yes, there was one, a French king. He was called the Sun King, Louis XIV. He ruled for 72 years. Never had a bath in his life, by the way. He was frightened of water. He ruled for 72 years. Queen Elizabeth is about to rule for 70 years. And what a remarkable woman, queen, she has been. Look at what happens around the family. Look at, the, look at her sons. Look, look at the, the things that have happened in the family. The tragedies, the disasters. And yet that woman has maintained an integrity that is unbelievable. You and I know about human nature. That is a remarkable situation. So it's not something that sort of just fell out of the sky. It's something that God said was going to happen. And that's exactly what he has said. So I want you to come to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 23. And we owe our understanding of this chapter, the section that I'm going to be talking about, largely to the work of our brother Ken Whitehead. He saw this a long time ago. And I'm going to ask, as I said, our recorder to send out this article, amongst other things. He wrote an article in 2016, when Brexit was happening, about Isaiah 23. And it's right on the mark. We will examine it. Here we are in Isaiah 23. Look at verse 1. Now read it carefully. The burden of Tyre. How ye ships of Tarshish. Now hang on, stop. The burden of Tyre. How ye ships of Tarshish. So what have we got? Tyre, Tarshish. As one. Well, of course, we know what happened. Tyre, the great trading power of the times going right back to David and Solomon and right through the centuries, Tyre spread out its tentacles all across the Mediterranean and they ended up going to places like Venice and then right across towards Spain and ultimately Tarshish, Britain, became part of their trading empire. Think of Tyre, think of Tarshish. They're essentially one and the same thing. A monarch, we read in verse 15 of Isaiah 23, is going to sit upon a throne, the throne of Tyre. It says this in verse 15. And shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years. Think about that. Forgotten. Forgotten in what way? Well, loss of trade. Loss of ability to trade with the rest of the world. Look at verse 14. How? ye ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste. That's exactly what happened to Britain. From the time that Queen Elizabeth sat upon the throne in, in 1952, Britain fell apart. Its war debt had to be repaid. It made some foolish, stupid mistakes in relation to the Suez Canal and other things. And it ended up becoming a second-rate power for nearly 70 years. But it's over. It's over. And we see in that article we just put up on the screen that they're going to have a massive worldwide campaign to build up trade with all the nations on the earth, which is exactly what this prophecy says. Its trading power will be an economic decline during those years. We read verse 14. We read verse 15. Look at verse 16. Taken heart, go about the city, thou harlot that has been forgotten. Now, so why would Tyre, Tarshish, that is, Britain of the latter days, and we know it's a latter day prophecy, as you'll see in a minute, why would they be called a harlot? Well, bear this in mind. Queen Elizabeth is the head of the Church of England. And the Church of England was formed by one of her predecessors, of course, King Henry VIII, who, because he wasn't allowed by the Pope to divorce and remarry, he cut the Catholic Church off and created his own church. But their practices and their doctrines were a carbon copy of the Roman Catholic Church. Nothing really changed except the headship of the church. In other words, they were one of the daughters of the harlot system of Rome. So they're a harlot. And of course a harlot trades with her body. 
just as Britain has traded on the oceans, sent forth its ships, became the massive empire that it was until the Second World War. It was a trading power. So here we've got a prophecy that, that those halcyon days would come to an end. Take a heart, go about the city thou harlot that has been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. Yeah, well they weren't remembered. Because you see, for 70 years Britain was in a parlous state in terms of trade. They were locked in to the European Union. They were restricted to trade with the European nations. It couldn't do what they'd previously done. And at the end of that period, her prosperity will be restored by God. Look at verse 17. And it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that Yahweh will visit Tyre and she shall turn to her high. She's going to go out on the oceans again. And she'll commit fornication, that is trading, like the Catholic system does with religion. She'll go out trading with the nations. And she'll commit fornication with all the kings of the world upon the face of the earth. It's about to happen. As Queen Elizabeth reaches 70 years on the throne. And then we read in verse 18 these words. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. Now stop. What do you reckon that means? It, it means this. That the revival of British trade will be used in its initial stages anyway by the Lord Jesus Christ. The prosperity that they will develop in the coming years prior to Armageddon. That's why they're called the merchants of Tarshish. Prosperity that will develop, though it will be affected by the great collapse that is shortly to come. They will be there in the forefront of the nations. And when Christ comes and Armageddon sweeps aside the powers of this world, Britain will contribute to the development of the kingdom of God. That's what that verse is about. Verse 18. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. It shall not be treasured nor laid up. They won't have it for themselves. For her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before Yahweh. That might be you and me, verse talking about there, to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. Britain has a bright future in the early days of the development of the kingdom of God. It will take, as we know, 40 years. So like Ezekiel 38, verse 13, Isaiah 23 required Britain to be free from Europe at the time of the end. What a remarkable prophecy that is. And I'll send you Brother Ken's article on that. Well, what about the pandemic? Seems to rule our lives, doesn't it? The pandemic. The year began with COVID-19 spreading across the globe in third and fourth waves. And by early December 2021, there had been, they say, this is of course probably a, a number that's well under the true figure, 262.5 million cases of COVID around the world. And 5.23 million people who had been recorded as dying from COVID around them. That's probably well under the mark. For example, India. A lot of people were just burnt, cremated, before they got into the figures. Many countries are now experiencing a fourth wave, even after concerted vaccination campaigns, including booster shots. And desperation by governments to restore travel, commerce and income saw strict vaccine mandates imposed. Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters and young people, if there is an imposition of very strong mandates as to what we can and can't do in the coming days and months. Riots and violent protests erupted across Europe, the US and Australia against the loss of so-called freedoms We've seen violence in the streets and threats being made towards politicians as people demand the right of, of choice. Well, that's the state of the world we're in right now because everything is really on fire. Now, you got this article. This was, this was sent out to you a little earlier this year. And I'm going to quote from it to lead us to the end of this talk tonight. It's by a fellow called Tyler Durden, but he's borrowed the words... From this other gentleman, Egon von Greyers, who was writing for a, a publication called Gold Switzerland. So it was written for people to encourage them to buy gold, to get out of stock, to get out of, of US dollars and go into gold. 
But you know, you could not get a more accurate description of what is actually happening in the economic world. He says a global fire is coming. But at certain times in history, the fire will be cataclysmic. And that is where the world is now. Explosive fires have started everywhere already. Stock markets are on fire. And so are property markets. That's certainly true. As well as bond and debt markets. The problem is that fires are initially explosive, but always end up implosive. In other words, the whole thing collapses on itself. Yes, everything is really on fire as people are desperate to just spend, spend, spend after a year of lockdowns and restrictions. Try to buy a house in Queensland of late. It's on the market for four or five hours and it's gone. Usually bought by people from the south wanting to get out, get out of the southern states. Can't buy a house. And expl but explosive fires, he writes, are all, always ending everything burning down or imploding eventually. And this is just what is going to happen in the next few years. A massive forest fire is not just totally inevitable, but it is also an absolute necessity. Because economic bubbles consist primarily of air and lots of it. When empires or countries run out of money, all they have to replace it is air to keep the economy going. The air consists of false promises combined with lots of air in the form of fake money. Since air is free, governments can produce unlimited amounts of it. And without exception, gullible people want to believe that it is actually real money and not just empty air. The beauty for the government is that they can just produce and borrow trillions of dollars at zero cost. And by manipulating interest rates, they can borrow this money also at virtually zero cost. It is a bubble, as they say. But I found the most important part of this article, these three paragraphs. Under the heading, the world needs a big fire, this is what this gentleman wrote. We really need a proper, very big forest fire that gets rid of all the excesses, be they financial or social. Only then will the world again create new green shoots, free from debt and false values, both moral and financial. In other words, he's got no idea about the Bible. He's got no idea that Christ is coming. He's got no idea that the kingdom of God's about to be established on the earth. With well, all the benefits that will come from that. But he's talking about the restoration of godly values and morals. Isn't that interesting? Because that's exactly what the world needs and this is what will precede it. This huge implosion. But before that, the implosion of most debt and asset values will create a very difficult period of transition for the world. He says this, it could last one decade or several. How long it will actually last, only future historians can tell us. Bible students can tell you today. Because you see, the time of trouble, such as never was, will last for nearly 10 years, a decade. And then there's only really another 40 years beyond that before the kingdom is fully established and all the benefits are given to mankind. Yeah, we can tell you right now what's going to happen. There will be major suffering around the world, which will not just be financial, he says, but also social. We will see wars, civil wars, famine, disease and migration. Yep, but it will bring a changed world through that terrible suffering that will soon overtake mankind. We are on the verge of these things, brothers and sisters and young people. And I've often referred to this reference, so I think it's one of the most important references. And I'm getting emails from people who say that the saints are going to be left here to suffer all sorts of terrible, horrible things. Even nuclear war, one brother says. We're going to have to be left here to endure all of that. Rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. Because Christ said, you know this passage, Luke 17. Look it up with me again. Luke 17. Luke 17, he makes it very plain the nature of the times in which we will be removed to the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 26 of Luke 17. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. What were they doing? I'll give you the literal Greek. They were eating. They were drinking. Look what's happened. As soon as they take off the restrictions, as soon as they take down the lockdowns, all right, what happens? You get all sorts of, of, of events 
where people go nuts, completely nuts. Because you see, they're bursting out of the, of the restrictions that have been upon them in a way that they didn't do before. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying wives, they were giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. What about the times of Lot? Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So when God plucked Noah and Lot and their families out of the problems of the current situation that they were in, they were taken away, put in a position of safety, while the rest of the world collapsed, imploded. It's going to happen again. We won't be left here. Our challenge is not to be part of, the, of this hideous world in which we live, with all of its evils, not to be fooled by its so-called prosperity. It's all air. Not to be sucked in by this world in any way, but to stand faithful and firm like Noah and Lot. You see, when the Lord talks about these things, brothers and sisters, he makes no mention of violence or immorality in Luke 7. You look, look for it. Where, where does it say? Violence and immorality. It doesn't say. Would they exist? Of course they exist. He's not interested in that. He's interested in the one thing that he knows can destroy and undermine his people. Prosperity. There will be prosperity to the day that we are removed. Don't let anybody tell you that we're going to go through the great tribulation and have to suffer nuclear warfare. It's rubbish. We'll be taken out of prosperity. And if you don't believe that, have a really good look at Revelation chapter 3 and the letter to delay the sins. It's the only letter of the seven. It's the last letter. It's the only letter that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's at the door, brothers and sisters. And what was the problem of the ecclesia? Prosperity. That was their problem. Rich and increased with goods, having need of nothing. Yep, the time of trouble is coming. The world's economy will collapse. And there will be a period of time before Armageddon where we will be prepared to be involved in it. That day, brothers and sisters, is coming. And you look around, what do you see? You see a fulfilment of many, many Bible prophecies. And here's one of them. Revelation 11, verse 18. And the nations were angry. And they are. And thy wrath is come. I can see it building. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, along with you and me that are alive. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, who have remained faithful to the end. Them that fear thy name. Small and great, doesn't matter where you sit in the scheme of things, if you're faithful, you'll be there. And should us destroy them which destroy the earth. And that Greek word, diaphero, means to rot thoroughly. And haven't they done that? They're rotting the physical environment. And they've certainly rotted the moral environment. And we see so many things today that make you, you reach, you want to vomit. When you see the things that are going on, brothers and sisters, the day is at hand. Let us remain faithful. Let us be patient. Let us wait. Wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry.